Wednesday, hey everybody. I hope you are all having a good day so far. Um, we're going to go over Chapter 16 right now. And Chapter 16 has a lot to do with um, big business, uh, the big businesses that were emerging after the Civil War, uh, workers, labor unions, strikes, and all the turmoil that were, um, that were happening in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 began when rail companies, rail, the, the employers, began continuously cutting the pay of the employees. Now, um, even though they were profiting largely, they were reaping in huge amounts of money and government subsidies uh, and paid shareholders all these lucrative stock dividends, they were slashing workers' pay. Um, and the railroad system at this time in America in 1877 is the lifeline to getting products from one end of the country to the other. Um, now, through the strike, uh, workers destroyed nearly $40 million worth of property. It galvanized the company. It completely shut it down. And it convinced the laborers of the need for an institutionalized union. Um, they persuaded businesses of the need for an even greater political fluence and political aid. So you will now see um, politics become part of the norm for big businesses who wanted to make sure that their money stayed with them. And even though it was not successful uh, in itself, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 led to a new era of labor conflicts in the United States. Now, um, after the Civil War, uh, there is growing labor unrest accompanied, accompanied with industri industrialization. Many workers were uh, perceived as powerless in the um, in industries. They were mass producing machines. They were reaping in huge amounts of profit. And workers' strength as individual was even smaller and more insignificant, insignificant than com when companies grew in size and power. Now, employees were expected to work long hours. They were in dangerous working conditions. And the difficulty of supporting a family on a meager and unpredictable wage compelled armies of labor, of labor to organize and battle against the power of capital. Um, and during this time, you're seeing huge amounts of technological improvements and innovations. And uh, production costs and distributions are being uh, slashed. And you're also seeing plummeting transportation and communication costs. You're going to see the media, you're going to see the newspapers forming, where advertisements are going to be able to go out and companies are going to have more profit. By the turn of the century, corporate leaders and wealthy industrialists embraced the new principles of scientific management. Now, scientific management is also known as Taylorism after its founder, Frederick Taylor. Now, he urged all manufacturers to increase efficiency by subsidizing tasks. Now, his philosophy was rather than having 30 mechanics, uh, individually making 30 machines, that a manufacturer could assign 30 laborers to perform 30 distinct tasks, which dramatically sped up the process. Instead of you doing it all together, everybody had their own little part. Um, and if it was managed by trained experts, specific tasks could be done quicker and more efficiently. Taylorism inc increased the scale and scope of manufacturing and allowed for the flowering of mass production. Uh, you will start to see companies start mass producing lots of different things. Singer sewing machines, um, McGormick grain reapers, Duke cigarette rollers. They all realized un un unprecedented efficiencies and achieved unheard of levels of production that propelled their companies in the forefront of American business. You're going to see enormous amounts of profits coming into these businesses who have learned how to manufacture, manufacture products faster and efficiently. Um, one of the most famous people who made the assembly line was Henry Ford, and that allowed the production of automobiles to skyrocket and their costs plummet. Um, you will start seeing at that point start seeing the emergence of the car become uh, more of a normal use of transportation. Um, industrial capitalism realized the greatest advances in efficiency and productivity that the world had ever seen. 
Massive new companies marshaled capital on the unprecedented scale and provided enormous profits and that create of unheard of fortunes. But it has also created it also created millions of low paid, unskilled, unreliable jobs with long hours and dangerous working conditions. Industrial capitalism confronted gilded age Americans with unprecedented inequalities, and this is what you will uh, this is what is meant by the gilded age of America. There was an enormous deficit in how much money companies were making, yet how much money workers were bringing home. The sudden appearance of the extreme wealth of industrial and financial leaders alongside the crippling squalor of the urban and rural, rural poor shocked Americans. Uh, Henry George wrote in his 1879 uh, book, Progress and Poverty, that this association of poverty with progress is the greatest enigma of our times. Great financial and industrial titans, um, such as uh, rail, the railroad operators as Vanderbilt, Woolman as Rockefeller, Steele, such as Carnegie, and bankers such as J.P. Morgan, one fortunes, one fortunes that adjusted for inflation today are still among the largest the nation has ever seen. And uh, from statistics in 1890, the wealthiest 1% of Americans owned one-fourth of the nation's assets. Top 10% owned, owned over 70%. And the inequality only accelerated from there. By the 1900s, the richest 10% controlled 90% of the nation's wealth, an extremely unproportionate, improportionate amount of wealthy compared to poor. Um, during this time, U.S. Steel became the, becomes the first company in the world to make a billion dollars. Um, they're the billion dollar company, which are numbers that have never been heard of before. Now, as these uh, new fortunes accumulated, a small number of wealthy Americans, new ideas rose to bestow the moral legit legitimacy upon, these, uh, upon them. Um, they were reasoning, this is why this is happening. This is why we're making all this money, yet there's so many poor people. Um, in 1859, Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution through natural selection in the book the or on the origin of species. Now, social Darwinism is uh, identified as a natural order that extended from the laws of the cosmos to the workings of industrial society. All species and all societies, including modern humans, the theory went, were governed by relentless competitive struggle for survival. The inequality of outcomes was to be not merely tolerated, but encouraged and celebrated. It signified the progress of species and societies. Um, you will also hear of Herbert Spencer, who popular, popularized the phrase survival of the fittest during that time. Um, not everyone welcomed the, uh, the inequalities. The spectacular growth of the economy and the ensuing inequalities in living conditions and incomes confounded many Americans. Um, as industrial capitalism overtook the nation, it achieved political protections. Although both major political parties facilitated the rise of big business and used state power to support the interests of capital labor, big business looked primarily to the Republican Party. And I know we had discussed before that the Republican and Democratic uh, platforms had basically switched after the Civil War. This is where you're going to see that switch uh, take place. Republican Party was big business. Now, the ideas of social Darwinism attracted little support among the mass of Americans who were in the industrial, who were industrial laborers. Americans tooled in difficult jobs for long hours with little pay. Mechanization and mass production put skilled workers into unskilled positions. Industrial work ebbed and flowed with the economy. The typical industrial laborer could expect to be unemployed one month out of the year. They labored 60 hours a week and could expect their annual income to fall below the poverty line. Among the working poor, wives and children were forced into labor market to compensate. Crowded cities, meanwhile, failed to accommodate growing urban populations and skyrocketed rents, trapped families, and trapped families in crowded slums. Once again, the failure of the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 convinced these laborers, these workers, that uh, unions needed to be organized, uh, and union memberships began to climb. Now, in Chicago, police uh, forces uh, 
killed several workers breaking up a protest at the McCormick Reaper Works. Labor leaders and radicals called for a protest at Haymarket Square in the following day, uh, the following day, which police proceeded to break, break up. But as they did, a bomb exploded and, uh, and several policemen were killed. Um, the policemen started firing into the crowd, killing people in the crowd. Uh, the deaths of the Chicago policemen sparked outrage across the nation and the sensationalization of the Haymarket riot helped many Americans to start associ associating unions with radicalism. Um, eight Chicago, uh, the eight who they believed to have actually um, organized the Haymarket riot um, were convicted and were, four were hanged and one committed suicide. Um, seven out of the eight were immigrants, which that was an issue during the time with a, a lot of um, people being uh, against anyone other than Americans. They didn't want to see the Italian immigrants, the Irish immigrants, any, any, anybody that wasn't considered American at that time being, being there. Um, those people were convicted without any direct evidence implicating them in the bombings, uh, but they were still uh, convicted and uh, imprisoned or hanged. Now, we're going to start seeing um, the unions that became, that emerged. Uh, during this time, and the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL, um, whose first president was Samuel Gompers, emerged as a conservative alternate alternative to the vision of Knights of Labor. And the Knights of Labor was the first uh, known union. Um, the American Federal Federation of Labor was an alliance of craft unions, and and, and that's unions can composed of skilled workers. Uh, it rejected a vision of a pro producerist, producerist economy and advocated pure and simple trade unionism. And this, this program aimed for practical gains. They wanted higher wages, fewer hours, safer conditions through a conservative approach that tried to avoid strikes, but worker strikes would still continue. Um, There was uh, another strike that happened in 1894 called the Pullman Strike. Now, the Pullman Strike was where uh, car, uh, railroad car factories uh, were cutting wages by quarter but kept rents and utilities in the company towns the same. Now, what company towns were, uh, were houses where the workers lived, so they cut the wages but kept everything else costing the same. Were the workers. So thousands of workers went on strike and the national railroad traffic ground to a halt. And unlike in every other major strike, usually the governor of that state would sympathize with the workers and, and do nothing about it. But in July, President Grover Cleveland dispatched thousands of American soldiers to break up the strike and a federal court issued a preemptive injunction uh, against the union's leadership, who was Eugene Debs, and the strike violated the injunction. He was arrested and imprisoned, and eventually the strike ended because they didn't have their leader there to hold, hold the protests and the strike together. Now, um, another movement I want to talk about is the populist movement. And the populist movement is actually going to form a political party out of their movement. And there is a farmers' alliance. Um, and those members organized a political party, the People's Party, or the Populists, as they became to be known. Uh, the Populists attracted supporters across the nation. They appealed to those convinced that they were, there were deep flaws in the economy, in the political economy, um, in this gilded age. Uh, and they uh, believed that the flaws were, were rejected and refused to be addressed by both political parties, by both Democrats and Republicans. Nobody was paying attention to what needed to be done. They emerged and actually uh, had a candidate in the 1892 presidential election, and they became the most significant third party ever in American political process. Um, the populists believe uh, they wanted a free ballot 
and fair counting in all elections. Uh, and they wanted a secret ballot system. Um, uh, they also asked, or their platform also asked, stated that revenue derived from a graduated income should be applied to the reduction of the burden of taxation now levied upon the domestic industries of this country. They wanted a single tax system for taxpayers. Um, they pledged to support fair and liberal, liberal pensions to ex-union soldiers and sailors. Uh, they commended to the federal consideration of the people and the reform press the legislative system known as the initiative and referendum. And they also resolved that they favor a constitutional provision limiting the office of the president and the vice president to one term and providing for the election of senators of the United States by direct vote of the people. We're going to go on um, to discuss the Socialist Party. Um, I know there's a lot of negative connotation with the socialists, with the term socialist. Um, American socialists argue that wealth and power are con consolidated in the hands of too few individuals, that monopolies and trusts control too much of the economy, and the owners and investors grew rich while the workers who produced their wealth, despite massive pro productivity gains and rising national wealth, still suffered from low pay, long hours, and unsafe working conditions. Um, Karl Marx, uh, had described the new industrial economy as a worldwide class struggle between the wealthy bourgeois who own the means of production, such as factories and farms, and the proletariat factory workers and the tenant farmers who worked only for the wealth of others. Um, Eugene Debs, who was uh, the one arrested in the Pullman strike, actually became uh, founder and leader of the Socialist Party of America in 1901. Now, according to Eugene Debs, socialists sought the overthrow of the capitalist system and the emancipation of the working class from wage slavery. And that's where I'm going to talk about, you know, there are a lot of negative connotations with socialists. In theory, the socialist system looks good because what they want is trying to build up uh, everybody. There, there's not going to be anybody kind of left behind. Now, when enacting a theory, it doesn't always work out that that was their theory. That was under which... Uh, they presided. So, under an imagined socialist cooperative commonwealth, the means of production will be owned collectively, ensuring that all men and women received a fair and equal wage for their labor. Ownership, ownership of the trust by the government and the ownership of the government by the people. Like the populace, however, socialists had tapped into a deep well of discontent and their energy in organizing filtered out into American culture and American politics, even when the party did not survive. So you don't hear of the Populist Party, you don't hear of the Socialist Party, um, but it did survive the ideas, the ideas that this is not right, something's wrong, um, we don't feel like we're being taken care of, this is supposed to be a country of the people and for the people, and it's a country of the rich and for the rich. So you will see, um, you will see that movement, you will see, um, in the next chapter we're going to go on to westward expansion and talk about uh, the economy as the United States starts encroaching to the West. Um, the one thing I want you to take away from this chapter is that um, big business has emerged. Uh, the workers are not happy. Laborers are not happy. They're starting to form together, to come together and form unions um, and political parties. Um, a lot of the problems you're starting to see now are still with us today. We're still trying to figure out how to how to work it all out. So I hope you all have a good rest of your day. And thank you so much for listening and I will see you later.